Welcome to this digital roundtable session on Managed Futures, hosted by Hedge Nordic. Joining us are Razvan Remzing from Aspect Capital, Matt Stevenson from Florincourt Capital, Trans Trends Harold de Boer, and Lucas Wojtovich from Quantica. In this video, you will hear about the manager's description and perception of risk, the challenge in the CTA narrative, how trading models react to volatility, the effects and opportunities of inflation, and much more. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for this Managed Future Roundtable. Maybe we start off by a quick introduction, if uh, each of you can just give a quick overview of how your trading systems, how your models work, what the DNA of your uh, approach is. And maybe we start with Razvan. Hi, thank you for listening to us. Um, I'm Razvan, I represent Aspect Capital. We're a London-based systematic I'd say provider of liquid alternative investment solutions spanning trend as well as macro and currencies. We manage about $9.5 billion and our institutional client base is, is global. And I'd say within trend following, we have a range of capabilities. I'd say right from single factor pure trend to more multi-model diversified trend alternative markets trend, as well as more recently, a dedicated China futures only trend strategy. My name is Matt Stevenson. I'm the head of product management at Florencourt Capital. Uh, we're a relative newcomer among these august competitors among us. Uh, we are run by a well pedigreed team of uh, folks with extensive market backgrounds. Our sole focus as a systematic investment manager is maximizing risk adjusted returns for our investors by harvesting operational alpha inherent with more exotic or alternative markets. Um, simply put, we avoid standard market exposures of our larger peers. Uh, we instead apply time-tested, robust systematic trading methods to operationally difficult and usually newer global macro markets. So we have the Florencourt Capital Program that currently manages about $1.2 billion uh, across an institutional client base. Uh, and we have the backing of Bremer and Partners, which is one of the largest hedge fund managers in Scandinavia. I'm Harold, I'm the old man in the room. Mm -hmm. I work since, uh, for, with Tronsen since 1989. And we started the first one trend program in 1992. Our main edge is uh, the diversification in the program. Uh, and uh, another thing that we are uh, have a background in commodities, that means that we tend to be somewhat more active in commodity markets than most other CTAs. My name is Lukas Wojtovic. I'm with uh, Quantica Capital. Uh, we are a medium term trend following CTA that has built a, a 16 year track record. Um, we focus on rather the more liquid financial futures globally. And where we slightly different is that we try to identify trends on a relative basis with the goal of finding more divergent markets that exhibit greater risk-adjusted trend-following opportunities. And as such, we have a, a slightly different risk allocation, perhaps to some of the other competitors where we actually allow a higher degree of flexibility and, and, and the portfolio concentration and risk factors that, that uh, exhibit these um, good trend following opportunities. Um, I understand the SG CTA index is up around 10% for the year. The trend index is up a bit more around 13, 14% for the year. Um, Razvan, can you give us a quick overview of how the trading year went for markets? Where was there money to be made? Where was money to be lost? What trades did you have to play? There's been a lot of action with inflation initially coming back sort of expectation and then sort of starting to play out in, in, in across many markets. So that's really been caught across commodity markets. Um, but interestingly, we've also seen a lot of good trends outside of the less traditional fixed income markets. So whereas the more, uh, your more standard, your treasuries, your bonds, your, you know, your more traditional fixed income curves have been rocked by um, expectation management from the central banks, the more um, esoteric ones, the smaller central banks have really been able to offer us more idiosyncratic opportunities. So we've seen, to me in summary, if I look at it, the more directional, the better this year, um, the more commodity heavy, the better, uh, potentially the more, the less traditional, or, or so to speak, the less standard markets, the better. 
And so across our spectrum of strategies, we've seen good returns across alternative markets, commodities in China as well, where we have a very commodity heavy presence that's been almost entirely um, uh, not affected by the sort of the financial markets um, gyrating, particularly in fixed income. And unlike other years, I think speed is less of a differentiator this year. It's been far more about asset allocation and being in sort of the right markets as opposed to necessarily trading more quickly or more slowly. Yeah, how, how do you see that? And what, what do you th see also as main factors for dispersion among the different managers and styles? Now the, the dispersion is great. And I, I think um, we all in the industry have to be very grateful to the wise people of AQR for accelerating this, this idea that the whole performance can be explained by style. It cannot. Um, and we have to be even more grateful to them for proving so convincingly and so consistently that they were completely wrong. And not only they were wrong, the whole industry was wrong. Because the more we have been embracing this idea that it's just style, the more our performance deteriorated. Uh, CTAs have always been doing the best when there was a huge dispersion. The best years of CTAs were the, 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 the famous crisis years, and those years the dispersion was great too. I think we should say that without a decent amount of dispersion, CTA will not perform and cannot perform. So I also hope that in this, this room, there's a lot of uh, things that we disagree on because only when we disagree, we all can do well. It's interesting to see over the year how the inflation trade went from uh, unsure with the reopening in the first quarter to it's definitely here going through the middle two quarters of commodities and particularly energies just going through the roof. And then finally, we're now in this world of what are you going to do about it? Uh, for the G3, there's <laughs> there's almost a, a there, there's a playbook, which is uh, talk about possible tapering sometime down the road, and the market does what it does and basically decides that the 10-year bond is going to oscillate between 1.4 and 1.75. Whereas for countries like Chile or Russia, there's no option; they have no option but to raise rates, and they have to raise rates lot. Lucas, as an industry some years back, we may have felt that uh, by today managed futures would be in, in every institutional portfolio, maybe also in many retail portfolios, but that never happened. It never took off. Is there maybe a flaw in the narrative and the communication of uh, the CTA as an industry? And it might be interesting to hear Harold's take on that. I think many institutional investors do get it and 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 it really also depends on, on who you are and, and 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 how long your investment horizon is i mean there are well known um, investors uh, that keep a constant exposure to to ctas who basically know that this is this is one of the few sources of proper diversification when there is a prolonged crisis you know when there is an asset deflation scenario and uh, and that really and, and they really believe this is something that you should you should have no matter what happens. And actually, as we have seen, stocks um, rising quite dramatically over the past 18 months, there is actually a case to even allocate more to, to, to balance these portfolios. But on the other hand, as these risky assets continue to appreciate, and then especially equities, some investors, uh, I think they're simply question whether there is a need for diversification at all. And, um, and I think what is challenging is that sometimes we do exhibit some shorter term positive or negative correlation to, uh, to stocks and, and also bonds. And I think now investors try to look at it through the lens of how much benefit a, a CTA can add to the portfolio. And they try to look at your exposure to the dollar and your exposure to commodities. And, and, and they're trying to make these macro calls, thinking whether it will be beneficial to their portfolio or not, which we know is an extremely difficult thing to do. And, and also, timing every entry and every exit that you know you're pretty much guaranteed to lose money in, in the long term on, on, on that trade so i think i think this is the major this is the major uh, challenge for us and also i think you know when when we talk about different panelists here we rather focus on a slightly more medium to long term trend following opportunities uh, and as such, you know, the recent dislocations have been extremely short-lived. So people almost want you to provide that protection when there is a two-week dislocation. Now, 
that is almost an impossible challenge, you know, thing to do when you're when your investment horizon is measured is measured in weeks or in months. When I started pitching CTAs, standard CTAs, medium-term CTAs, um, more than a decade ago, um, it was to a crowd that saw us as black boxes, right? It was to a crowd that thought that there was no way they could understand what it is that we do. And to an extent, I think we um, overperformed in the uh, explanation category, which is we were very, it was very clear about how it is that trend followers make money. I mean, you could just very easily write it on the back of a napkin. You know, it's the sort of uh, cut your losers and let your winners run type philosophy that uh, people can really kind of grasp a hold of and understand. But uh, I think this connects to something that Harold said earlier is that I think what ends up happening is that uh, we may have done such a good job of demystifying the black box that folks believed that this is all a trend beta and that this could be achieved in extremely low cost manner. And I think that what has happened over time is the people that figured that, that took this education to begin with, there's a little bit of a Dunning-Kruger effect, it seems like, which is, is that they, they figured they knew everything there was to know about CTAs, they buy a cheap implementation, then all of a sudden they're very disappointed. Uh, at this sort of tracking error with the uh, SG trend index or any of the uh, any of my colleagues here, to be frank. Um, so I think that that's been a real challenge. The other challenge I think that has happened is that instead of hitting this particular point head on, which was sort of during 2013, 2014, I think, is a lot of uh, us sales guys, uh, we decided to go tangential, which is we talked about crisis alpha, crisis alpha, crisis alpha. And we said, okay, it's no longer about getting the returns in a diversified way. This is about protecting you during times of drawdown. And that's a double-edged sword, particularly as Lucas mentioned with a medium term trend program, uh, what people think about as the, the crisis is a one week drawdown in the s and I mean, look at Q1 2020 as, as a prime example, right? And so if you've marketed yourself on a crisis alpha pitch uh, and you don't perform when people perceive a crisis, um, then they're unhappy. Your story about that it is more understandable and has become more understandable and better understood also is the biggest pitfall for CTAs. Um, I'm the old guy here. So when, when I started, uh, there didn't exist no style. The style trend following didn't exist. There were CTAs and they were doing something and all of us were doing well, but we were not a style. And I, over the years, I found out how many luck we had by not being a style. Because it meant that people that came in, new people working for our office, they had, didn't have a new kind of uh, convention in their head. Now people that start have a convention in their head because trend is also a convention. And that kind of convention doesn't lead to, to having good ideas. When there is no convention, it's very easy to be non-conventional. Mm -hmm. And we only can do well when we are non-conventional. And as soon as it becomes a style and becomes a convention, people stick to just that and bring this, this, this narrow definition of what trend following is and where the returns come from may be good for commercial reasons, but it becomes very bad if we ourselves think it's only that, because then it's going really bad. And that, that's also the, the ultimate thing with this, this whole factor analysis idea. What it really does is it explains correlation. Style explains correlation and nothing more than that. The absolute returns come from something else, come from trading, from really understanding markets, doing what you have to do, be done in the markets. And it's very, very easy, especially in, in backtesting, uh, to show to bring simulated returns, and that, that's that's an, an, a specialism. That's an, an, another specialism. To bring real life returns is something different. Yeah, to get them correlated again is not that difficult, but to get a positive return is, is good, and 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 that's that's the very nice thing. If you look at uh, the, the the famous story of uh, of of AQR in the demystifying minutes futures, they explain where the correlation comes from but their source of absolute return was completely wrong because their source of absolute return ultimately was the idea that you can execute without market impact. Mm -hmm. They take zero uh, market impact into account. While the 
only driver of return has always been the strength of market flows, of capital flows. We are driving on capital flows. So you cannot come with an academic theory that explains that there is no capital flows. Now then you're taking away the ultimate driver of it. If you think about the, the allocators and, and the lifespan at, at for how long they recommend a strategy, they might be in, in, in that job for maybe three to five years. Then they're very sort of incentivized to sort of manage career risk as well as investment risk. And a positively skewed strategy is actually quite difficult to hold behaviorally. And so, so the way I sort of look at it is, is just you just take just simp our simple equity markets that you can buy for next to nothing in a in a in an ETF in your um, trading account. Two out of three months are positive for equity markets with no skill. You just have to just be exposed to them, and that's it. So that that feels good. You then have to make an active decision to allocate to something else. And, and they hear us, and we talk about diversification and and all these things and the positive skewness which effectively the way I see positive skewness is you mm -hmm. go down the escalator and you go up the elevator with your return stream. And so with CTAs, pick your index, pick your fund, generally speaking, just more than maybe half the months are positive. And actually every time that these guys get a print, you know, my CTA is maybe a bit negative, a bit positive. You, you, you sort of, you're starting to behaviorally struggle against this widely held asset class. And when equities fall, that one, one in three months or the bigger crisis, well, we all hold equities. Misery loves company. What are you going to do? We all sort of have big drawdowns and, and then it's probably too late to buy a CTA. You know, as we all spoke about the long-term investor, the one that understands has the patience, the understanding and the support to hold through the cycle. Because once you've been through a cycle and you've seen where the returns come from, I think we actually end up finding that these investors are quite sticky and, and, and they get it. It's, it's, and it's, it's all the investors that come in right after a, a run of performance and then they can't hold the, behaviorally can't hold the, the strategy. A few years back, it felt like one of the first questions you casually asked the manager, well, how volatile is your fund or what's your volatility target? And they would say 10 and people would go, uh, and you would say 50 and people would go, oh. Um, so I was just wondering, what, what is your perception of volatility and do manage futures, do you view volatility in a different way, also considering that you can trade volatility today? Um, and it is, could be an integral part of your risk management or your trading strategy. Do CTAs view volatility different than other hedge fund strategies? In principle, uh, volatility fuels our strategy. Uh, in any investment, uh, it's about uh, receiving a risk premium. And, uh, and you should wonder when you are bearing a risk premium, uh, what kind of risk are you accepting? And uh, I lately explained to a client, a potential client, that essentially you can choose, do we want to have a high volatility, high daily volatility in the program? Or do we want to have no volatility, but every now and then, uh, well, the LTCM kind of first strategy, which was great. Or uh, do we essentially want to pay for for a uh, risk premium for not having that. And what you then get is a very low volatile program that has very long, long lasting uh, drawdowns. And it's a nice thing if you compare different CTAs on one axis, you place the daily volatility and on the other axis, uh, you, you place the, uh, the drawdowns, you will not get a line. Um, the, the, the nice thing is that you can better have a highly and higher daily volatility with uh, not such long lasting drawdowns. And, um, and that is a very logical thing because somewhere the risk has to end and it can better show up in a higher volatility, more surely daily volatility. If it's monthly volatility or yearly volatility, okay, the clients can become nervous, but uh, a daily volatility, uh, investors should not be afraid of that because that's essentially what our role is in the market or what an investor's role is in the market too get that risk and we can diversify it is the only thing we can do but apart from that uh, we have to take it into account we have to, to bring it in the program and uh, in the past years or let's say after 2008 uh, 2009 that period of course there was a lot of demand for trend programs and then there was a require or a request from can you do it with less risk with lower volatility well that was a very bad 
it, it, uh, you can do that in uh, in, in in simulations again uh, in back testing you it's very easy to bring down the, the volatility of the program but in real life it and it, it leads to indeed lower volatility but even more than that deeper drawdowns and uh, that switch is very important to make but let 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 the volatility come in realize that we require volatility we are never going to make money in the market there is no volatility in that market and we have to let that volatility flow into our program because that's the only thing that will drive our return as a function of, of that i think investors are primarily interested in what impact it has in the long term right so some of them feel more or less comfortable with, uh, with, with, with the daily volatility that Harold mentioned, you know, whether you're up or down 1% or 3%, uh, because at the end of the day, it's a path that leads you somewhere, right? So if you, so, so I think that is the, the, the major talking point uh, with our existing investors and, and prospecting investors. And, and we, we, we actually run all of 12 on, uh, you know, on a, on a gross basis. That's what we target. We don't target it on a, on a daily basis, we actually leave a little bit of room for, for that short-term volatility control. So it basically oscillates between 10 and 14%. And, and we tell investors that, you know, if you have a strategy with a X realized sharp ratio of a 16 year um, history, you know, you need to assume that once in a while, the drawdown can be X or Y and, and they need to feel comfortable with that. But, uh, it's sometimes not an easy conversation to have because they don't want to experience 12 or, or 14 or 16% drawdowns. The great thing about volatility for us is uh, volatility is, it's easier to forecast volatility than it is to forecast returns. Uh, it's, there's a certain persistence in market volatility that uh, sticks around a bit longer than what the returns do. If, if, uh, if only we could forecast with the same clarity on, on when trends were going to reverse as we could with uh, how persistent the volatility is going to be. So basically, we can run the entire program with that in mind, with the idea that we can better forecast what the volatility will be tomorrow than we can what the return will be and, and, and size accordingly. You know, it's frequent. You know, we're among the first to, to put you know, cryptocurrencies in our portfolio, for instance. And folks are like, oh, how could you possibly trade that? It's so volatile. And, and you say, okay, well, kind of, you know, here's the main point, right? Is that you can trade cryptocurrency with a 10% a annualized vol. It's just a matter of how much cash you're over collateralizing with. I mean, it's actually fairly simple. Uh, and once you do that, it's interesting to make that example of, you know, cryptocurrencies trend fantastically well once you control for the volatility. So it's a, it's a great asset class to trend follow as an example. So I think volatility actually plays just such an, integral part. The other part that I think in general works is particularly, it depends on the type of trend following style that you're using. Um, but what I'm familiar with at least is in general, um, trends tend to reverse during about a burst of volatility. You'll get a burst of volatility, then a, then a, a change in trend. So using that burst of vol as a cash out mechanism, basically, you know, which happens if you size your positions based on volatility, you cash out of your winners during the burst as opposed to when the reversal happens. So it gives you a head start. Once you control for volatility, uh, the other tails tend to work in your favor. The kurtosis and the skewness tend to work in your favor when you're using something like a trend strategy. So in a sense, when you control for vol, you're controlling for a lot of the, of the, lot of the worst, right? In which case, as was mentioned, drawdowns are slow bleeds. Drawdowns are not LTCM style, or even you know what happened in September with with some of our erstwhile fixed income RV colleagues, right? Uh, those things don't happen with trend, and the rationale is precisely because if you control for vol on a day to day basis, the kurtosis you realize in your strategy uh, doesn't blow you out of the water in the same way. For many laymen, the term vol is a synonym for risk. Like you would say, our strategy runs 30% vol, and they would go, oh, that's very risky. What do you find are relevant risk measures when you look uh, into your trading strategies, into your portfolios? And are those the same as you would describe to a potential investor? Uh, how you would describe, describe risk to them? And are there any key metrics that are useful to assess risk, looking at MAR or sharp ratios or Sortinos? bars, 
I can't sort of settle on, on one particular measure or answer that I think encompasses risk. Um, you know, with our strategies, it's about providing as complete a picture to our clients about what they should expect. Uh, as we know, um, almost back to, to what, what the others were saying on, on the, vol, the vol point, I think volatility is is the feature that we capture. And actually, you know, we want to steer our clients to appreciate, accept, embrace, and potentially one day love volatility. Because, you know, if, if you think of an asset, you know, if you think markets that have gone very, very quiet, um, those are problematic markets. I mean, you might, you might find that you know, maybe trends when they're really super extended or when they're sort of really, really persisting, they, they go quite quiet. But effectively what you're seeing is that that means there's consensus on that, on that view. And generally from too much consensus, almost like we started this discussion, that the moment everyone agrees uh, that that is when you have your biggest um, uh, miscalculations. So for us, you know, we want to make sure that clients understand the higher moments in our strategies, which the sharp ratio is not very friendly towards. It penalizes a, an up 10 month with the same um, uh, effect as a, as a down 10 month. Uh, we think that where there are different types of allocators. So allocators, some of them are, as, as we spoke, some of them are looking really on, on a diversification point of view. They're trying to complement equity markets. They're trying to complement maybe other macro managers trying to complement commodity allocations. And so there it's about understanding timing of your, of your peak risks, understanding the, the risk return profile alongside the, the, the strategy. But there is no, I'd say there's no one measure that, that, we, that, that we suggest is the most important. When we run our strategies, we care about peak risk. We care about the ability to roll out our positions. We care about the, the ability, what happens in the tails when you have very big events. Um, how much are you exposed to to a, to, a, to a big exogenous shock? So those are all, uh, but not, none of those things are really captured in, in one particular ratio. And I think our challenge as educators and sort of going out to market is to to know the shortcomings or the pros and cons of each of those measures that maybe investors are looking at. And then be able to position your strategy and help them understand why, what that sharp ratio is relevant for and what it isn't, what a Sortino is relevant for and it isn't, and, and, and just give them as many metrics as possible so that they have a clearer view of the full range of, of, of um, returns they could expect from us. Uh, the, the, the challenge is to communicate that to clients. So obviously clients also have some vision of of what a risky investment is and you have so many different you know hedge fund styles and some of them great sharp ratios until they don't so we try to to educate and to tell them what are the features of the of the medium term trend following strategy so i think majority of investors agree that it would be great if, if the sharp ratio was you know at one and a half but but they understand that with that approach it might be difficult to achieve over 10 or 20 years so you know i, I mentioned we, we focus a lot on, on, on talking about exposures and, and about volatility and about what is the target annualized volatility for the strategy because it might give investors some form of an indication or a view um, what they can expect when, when there is a drawdown. Um, but for us, the most, important, the most important thing is to really build partnership with these clients so that they, they might invest in a just before a drawdown or during the drawdown um, and and they need to be they need to understand you know what what it really means and they need to they need to um, analyze the past and, and hopefully they will see that we were able to demonstrate over 16 year time horizon that these drawdowns happen but then you get out of them and and because you're a systematic manager and you stick to your process you actually have a chance of doing that what do you see is is the most important role of a cta in a diversified portfolio is it a performance contributor, is it diversification, is it tail risk, prices alpha, long vol, all of the above? <laughs> yeah. But what's the what's single main function it should fulfill? 
all, all singing, all dancing, everything under one roof. Uh, sure. I think, to be honest, um, when we're talking about short-term CTAs, and maybe even into some medium term, but mainly for short term, I think there you have a legitimate claim as a long vol manager. Um, I think to market a CTA as a tail hedge is a dangerous thing. I don't think that that is a principal rationale for doing it because it, we've talked about already that uh, clients get disappointed uh, when you market yourself as we're going to protect you on the downside. Um, I think instead where we get a bit more traction is as a performance driver. Again, you know, the forward looking sharp expectation for CTAs. And again, with the caveat that we all know that sharp is a, is a, a misunderstood and a misspecified ratio for our type of strategy. You know, if CTA sharp going forward is, is probably standard CTAs in the 0.5 to 0.7 range and for alt market CTAs in the 0.1 range, or sorry, in the one, in the one range, not 0.1, I hope to God. Um, what we hope is the performance drivers to be there. Uh, but first and foremost, it's gotta be the diversifier, right? It's the stats say it, the stats tell it. Uh, as we've talked about is that, uh, you know, the vol and the correlation is more stable than the returns. So it's more persistent. Um, you look over a lot of windows and, and CTAs have provided that diversification. I'm personally quite happy that institutional prospects and clients are starting to view CTAs more in that sort of diversifier bucket rather than a crisis alpha type bucket. Um, but I think we also have to be honest with ourselves is I'm really, really happy and hope that we can close out this year in a, in a good fashion because long-term CTAs have got to do, we have to perform. <laughs> we, are, we aren't here as an insurance provider uh, so we've got to, um, long-term, you know, we've, we've got to perform and probably as Razvan said, if, if the allocator's perspective is three to five years, one hopes that you could have at least a sizable return over cash on that time period, uh, to justify being in the portfolio. We like to call it a, a smart diversification concept, right? Because if you if you decompose the returns and if you look at the track record and then you see, okay, where when did we have a very strong positive quarters for equities or very strong negative quarters for equities and now even more very strong positive quarters for commodities or for fixed income, right? Which is also uh, quite widely discussed now. You can actually decompose all of that and, and, and see how you performed and you will you will notice that Pretty much during all these market scenarios, you have a you have a positive uh, return expectations for a trend following strategy. Sometimes it's more, um, sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. But but you you can you can decompose it any way you want, and you will see that in any given quarter, um, you 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 have expected positive returns. So yes, sometimes it hurts to be in a drawdown because whether it's your it's your speed or the way you measure trend, um, it's not working precisely like that. I mean, we, we haven't had the best quarter last quarter. I, I know, I know it was a fantastic quarter for you guys, but we have uh, less commodities in our book and we were, and we had um, more difficult times with, with the fixed income, which was working fantastically well for us in the first five to six months. Um, so that you have to be open and honest about it and explain the driver of, of, of these returns. So it's really that source of diversification. And we were very happy to be able to demonstrate after everybody's been questioning whether you can ever make money being short fixed income, that in 2021, you can actually demonstrate tangibly that yes, you know, that was a, a, a positive trade and, and profitable one and, and diversifying your holdings quite dramatically as well. We know why we diversify. It is easy to explain. This isn't some machine learning or AI concept where it's, it is truly a black box and, and we hope that the machine puts us in positions that are different from what else is in your portfolio. But we can tell the person why their long equities are not 100% correlated with us. We can tell them why their long commodities is not 100% correlated with us. It's a, uh, and, and maybe we don't give ourselves enough credit in a sense that it is, it is actually trivial 
to describe why it is that CTAs and our types of strategies are so diversifying. Uh, and I think going forward, that could be an interesting opportunity, right? Is that you've got everybody who's, you know, they've filled their boots with private and um, illiquid. They've really gone long on illiquidity premium at the moment. And um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out as you have yields ticking up, right? As you have the yields ticking up, all of a sudden you can't roll over the debt for these holdings in a reasonable way. And things start to, you start having down ticks on valuations. I think you're right. And the, the, the only, I guess, challenge to that is, is that investors know we are very liquid and sometimes they use it to their advantage, obviously, and, and, and we get punished, right? Because if you think what happened in 2020, we have seen a lot of investors maybe not uh, disinvesting from CTAs, but but they were actually putting very aggressively cash into into private opportunities, into, into the dislocation that happened on the credit side. And, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, that was the right call. Uh, but I, but in, in, in years like 20, 2008 that you just mentioned, people desperately need cash. And it doesn't matter that you're up 20 or 30% and you're having a stellar year, they still need to get that cash from somewhere, right? So I truly hope that they, they size us in a, in, a, in a right way, that, that we have a place in the portfolio precisely to help them navigate whatever happens in the future. I think it's, it's, it's right that they can use that liquidity. I think it's, it's important that we can give it to the, to the investors and they tend to come back because they, it's again, it, it's, it's being able to deliver strong returns in a highly dislocated market environment with huge stress. They come to you, they get their money back, you're still performing well, and when the dust settles, they come back. When we talk about being a diversifier, it's also important to, to prove it that, that it's a real diversification. They can get their money out. So I think that's a real strength for the industry and we should be able to enforce that and deliver that. And if we do it well, the money should come back. Now that we see inflation coming into portfolio, sometimes very quietly, sometimes louder, what, what will it mean for financial markets and for different instruments if we do see real inflation? And what does it mean for your program in particular, but also for the, the industry, the CTA industry? Well, well the, the nice thing, what we've seen a lot and, and what you see also now is there is, is, a, is a, a demand in the market for programs that will do well in an inflationary scenario. And... Uh, People ask for that because they fear they're going to be, gonna be in a different scenario than they have been for a long time. But when you discuss about it, they preferably want to have that uh, proven by some back tests yes. in the past in which there was no inflation. And, and this is a very crucial element in, in here. Um, so there is this, this story again spread uh, among the factor people that uh, um, uh, trend is going to do well in an inflationary scenario. Well, uh, we are in a, more than a year now in an inflationary scenario and we see the dispersion is huge. And I think one of the main explanators for this dispersion in this respect is the more a program is based on historical optimization, the worse it will have been performing this year. And that doesn't mean, and it doesn't matter what kind of technique you've been using, whether you've been using all kinds of machine learning techniques or, or more old fashioned optimization techniques. But optimization is the worst thing to get a good performance in a period of a regime shift. Yeah. And, and there is the very nice thing that, on one hand, investors, yeah, but can you prove, can you give empirical evidence in the past 10, 20 years that this ID would have done well? Well, no, if we would then we would not have a regime shift. So and that's, 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 that's a very nice thing. So here you have to really do something as uh, explain that you're in control. And, and Matthew said that the why is so important. Well, in this respect, also, it's very important that we can explain what kind of choices we are making, what kind of choices we have to make to do well. And now looking back, you can, of course, see the, the uh, we have this, this period. And uh, inflation that we have seen this year is, is a, to a huge extent explaining the, the, the results of the different uh, programs, not only strength programs, but also other programs. And I think it's more of an explanator for the diversion than that dispersion than that it is an, uh, an explanator for the return. So for the next while, we're going to have variants on, on the inflation theme, but really got to have a dynamic directional approach that's quite unbiased, quite unfitted, really resilient regime shifts. Because I think what we do expect is that inflation will appear 
in bursts. It'll, it, it's a bit of a shock to the system. Uh, it'll cause instability regionally initially. Different central banks will behave at different rates. Like we've spoken earlier, we've seen you know, Czech Republic, Hungary, Norway, New Zealand, they're going to act. Um, the Fed is going to talk about it. Uh, and when they do act, it's going to take with them 80% of the liquid assets that are going to be correlated to what the Fed does. So in terms of, you know, we do expect trend to work relatively well if it's, if it's constructed robustly. Probably something shorter term, some shorter term strategies that maybe can capture the, the sort of the market shocks, the instability in the short term from central banks, you know, conceptually could work. Um, potentially some liquid relative carry models again, because we're expecting divergence across interest rates, currencies, maybe to come back. And that's about it. But I mean, we would expect, you know, and the rest of it is just keep your hat on, stay liquid, trade and don't fit too much. The old discussion, systematic versus discretionary. Um, Harold, where, where do you think your true advantages as a systematic trader lie and where may... Uh, discretionary guy, maybe a stock picker, just always be ahead of you guys. What's, what's really is the difference between systematic and discretionary has been changing over, over many years. And let's say systematic, if, if you explain systematic like a plane, then I, I, I agree. Uh, I, I should not try to fly myself. I can do my arms like this, but I'm really not flying. But uh, using a plane for flying is very good. But I think we should not Oh, uh, accelerating to the, the that effect of systematic to the extent that there should be automatic pilot that even also determines which route to fly it and which height to fly it and so on. Uh, that the pilot should always be in control. And I fear over the um, past decade we have been, and, and also some of our clients have been somewhat afraid for all kinds of uh, discretionary thing. And also we in the industry, uh, uh, some don't even dare to use the discretionary word in, in a conversation with a client. I think we should be more open about that. It's we, we are supposed to be the, the pilot in the plane that can take over, over the, 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 the wheel when necessary. And that can determine that we are flying uh, a different route because the wind is different than we expected. And, and that element is crucial. So having too little discretion in is, is a bad element. We, we need to, uh, what you were talking about, adding new markets, of course, that's completely discretionary. Completely discretionary. You do not have a machine that is collecting the markets and adding them into the program. It, it's, it's, uh, most of the things we are doing is discretionary. And in that aspect, uh, I would say, um, if you look at genes, uh, the, the, we compare apes with, with people and it's 98% of the genes are alike. Well, a, a good discretionary trader and a good systematic trader is also 98% of the genes is alike. And if not, then it's the systematic one that's wrong. I think taking a step back, it's, it's really for a lot of investors uh, still a fundamental question whether they feel comfortable with systematic approach and, and how it works. And, um, and really, we were able to demonstrate the robustness of the approach or of the strategy, as well as demonstrate that sometimes the best winning trades are actually very uncomfortable ones, right? So... Um, so I think, you know, it serves both well for the, for the signal generation, meaning what you actually trade and when you enter. And if you think about trend following, there's, there's been multiple conversations we have with clients about your equity exposure, about your fixed income exposure. And sometimes these are relatively uncomfortable things to do. Like if you are a discretionary trader and, and, and you sit and you try to build your position because, because that's, that's exactly what it is. But then if you think about the, the, the oil collapse in, in 2014, 2015, if you think about nat gas, if you think about some of these markets, then they, they were highly diversifying and added tons of, um, tons of uh, you know, revenue to, to, to the program. So, so that was all great. So, so I, I guess the most important part is that uh, that removes that everyday human emotion from the equation. And, and, and we very much like that approach and, um, and, and investors, especially doing discretionary uh, discretionary trading. There's also a question about you know, risk management, how you deal with that if you have shocks like uh, February or March 2020. So, so I, I think it, it has been proven over and over again that with a robust systematic approach, you're able to navigate that uncertainty in a fairly decent way and, 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 and you reach new high watermarks and, and, and you continue to deliver performance. Hedge Nordic, your single access point to the Nordic hedge fund industry. If you enjoyed this session, please like and share it.
Do visit Hedge Nordic's other roundtables and interviews, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel.